ask yourself, why is insecure code written? Why do we still have code with buffer overflows in it? A new buffer overflow vulnerability is being discovered. Why do we have SQL injection in huge amount of, of web apps? Why do we have just systems that are designed in poorly in terms of security where authentication isn't well thought out? You know, a lot of these problems are like solved. We, we know how to solve each of these individual issues. Why do they just keep coming up? And part of the answer is that it, it takes quite a lot of effort to get things done right. So, you know, you actually need to um, invest in, you know, training, understanding the security problems, doing the proper testing, um, and, you know, actually being careful about every line of code that you write. And, you know, time means money. Um, programmers are quite lazy, so if you, you know, leave it up to programmers, um, you know, then the, you know, it seems like a, a, a bad idea if you can help it. Um, some programmers won't know better. Um, and it's just quite hard to get it right. You need to put in quite a bit of effort to get this, to get this right. Um, there are certain programming languages and platforms that are easily vulnerable to certain kinds of attacks. And when you have new platforms and languages and things being developed, then, you, you know, there will be new security problems that are discovered in those systems or common mistakes that can be made in terms of security. Um, and <clears throat> so part of the issue is when you just basically uh, not really thinking about security and you're just developing stuff anyway. And not only that, but the prevalent way that we deal with security problems is like what's known as penetrate and patch. So we have like a problem that basically exists until someone finds it. And then they, um, you know, develop a fix for it and you fix the problem until the next problem is discovered. So it's very reactive. And um, you'll know from, um, you know, other topics um, that we've covered elsewhere around the window of vulnerability. So when a um, software vulnerability is first introduced, it takes some time before um, someone discovers it and then reports it to the, the vendor and then the vendor creates a patch and then the vendor releases that patch and then the end users eventually apply those patches. Um, and everywhere in between is an opportunity for attackers because there's this window of vulnerability where cis people are running insecure software. And it's even worse when you think about the fact that, you know, black hats won't necessarily share their findings with the rest of the world. So, um, you know, outside of their group or community. So, you know, you have certain vulnerabilities that aren't being patched. So, th you know, that, those are some of the problems with this reactive approach that's, that's taken. So how do we, like, fix things? How do we prevent these problems in our own software and systems? And the answer is to build security in and to consider security throughout the software development lifecycle. So in this video, I'm gonna talk a, bit, a little bit about um, secure life cycles and some of the proposals that have come from you know, certain groups, including uh, Microsoft, around how you can actually build in security to your development life cycle. So in general, security is, is more resilient if you build it in rather than try and add it on later. So, you know, a good example of this is Windows itself. So, you know, Windows 95, um, 98, and Millennium Edition um, were all based on this um, version of the operating system that was for consumers, and it didn't really have any security built into it. Um, you know, didn't have any access controls to speak of. Basically, the password that you type in when you logged into the computer just changed the desktop icons and desktop background. 
it didn't actually stop what you're allowed to do on the system. It's just like it's just a customization kind of thing. Um, as opposed to Windows NT, which was um, developed originally for servers, and they did think about security more on that side of it. Um, and at the end of the day, when they were, you know, taking the product forward, they they basically ended up binning the um, you know Millennium Edition um, kind of um, stream and kind of went with Windows NT because it's a lot easier to um, make the changes and make make the security um, at the um, design phase rather than afterwards. So it's quite hard to try and patch something in. If you've designed this whole system without thinking about security, it's practically impossible to then go back and add in all the levels of security that you would need uh, to make it a semi-secure system. And um, we'll see in a minute that Windows XP was not exactly a shining beacon of success at first on that uh, on that side either, but um, you know you can see you know where they were coming from with it. So, so what we need to do is actually build security into the stages of development. So when we're doing our software development, we need to think about um, each of the phases of the um, software development lifecycle. We need to be thinking about. Um, you know, how we build in security practices into the development of software. Um, and so that means we should be being proactive about it. And that means proactively designing and thinking about security while we are creating software, um, but also doing that automated analysis and using tools to help to basically um, tell us, you know, detect problems in our code uh, while we're developing it and, um, you know, before we release code and then we can also once we've released the code follow secure practices to like try and find the um, detect security problems afterwards as well and do code reviews and things uh, and uh, on an ongoing um, sort of maintenance cycle so in the early 2000s Microsoft were facing numerous security problems so Windows XP had been released and there were loads of bugs that were being discovered being used in worms, so you know you had things like Blaster and um, you know all these um, huge high-profile attacks against Windows XP systems, and also the IIS, the web server um, at the time, also was riddled with security problems. There's all this um, because essentially Windows is well. There's a few aspects of it. One is that Microsoft had not been doing what we were talking about. They weren't being proactive about you know, considering security at every stage of the development at that stage. And Microsoft were also in a market dominant position where there was a high um, um, benefit for being able to attack those systems. And so attackers spent a lot of time trying to attack Windows systems. So those two things combined is a per perfect storm for essentially what happened is a whole bunch of huge security problems. So. And then in January um, 2002, Bill Gates sent the trustworthy computing memo to all members of staff in Microsoft saying, basically, from now on, we're going to take security seriously and we're going to build it into uh, everything that we do. And it's the most important thing. And, you know, it's kind of saving face because this memo obviously leaked to the press. Um, so, but it was an important thing. And basically, they stopped developing um, new features. Um, and they stopped releasing um, products uh, and actually spent some time on training and actually getting all the developers in Microsoft some security training and actually building the security. Um, and so they drastically changed their development methodology to include security considerations at every stage of the um, software development. Um, so suddenly they were going to be taking security a lot more seriously um, and you, we can see now that that change had a demonstrable effect on the number of security vulnerabilities that are in their products. I mean, Microsoft still, you know, they're not immune. They still have security issues, but, you know, it's not uh, as dire as it was in the early 2000s um, and late 90s where there was just so many massive security um, vulnerabilities that were just discovered on a daily basis that were... Um, 
often complete system um, compromise vulnerabilities um, in the operating system itself. Whereas nowadays we've moved to most um, most vulnerabilities being found elsewhere, like in specific services and other pieces of additional software that gets installed, uh, and occasionally something in the operating system, but a lot less so now. Um, so this is what it looked like. So they came out with the security development lifecycle, which they've released to the public since then. Um, and it's this like collection of mandatory security activities presented in the order they should occur, grouped by the phases of the traditional software development lifecycle. Is that they originally um, kind of presented it, um, and it's kind of been simplified a little bit now in terms of being specific practices that you should follow. Because you can do this even if you're not following a waterfall software development lifecycle. So, you know, in the traditional software development um, way of doing things, we would basically always start by defining all of our requirements for a system, completely designing the system before we start doing any programming, and then we would develop the thing, do the implementation, and, and, and then maintain the thing. So, but you know, nowadays, agile development is a lot more popular. And um, so, but all these security things are, you know, just as relevant, if not more. So you don't have to follow the, the exact same sort of traditional development approach, but you can take these um, secure um, processes and build them into whatever actual software lifecycle that you use, you know, within your team, for example. So if you look at this diagram, you can see quite a lot, quite a bit of um, an, an overview of what happens at each stage. <clears throat> so they do, um, you know, during the requirements phase, we're also establishing security requirements, um, defining, you know, what quality level we need our code to be, doing some risk assessment to understand, like, what the risks are. In the design phase, we're establishing um, what the you know, design requirements are of the system, Analyzing attack surface, which is like all the different ways that our system could be attacked based on what the interactions are with other systems and people. Um, threat modeling, um, which we've talked about um, separately, when we're trying to understand the, the threats that our software or system space. Um, making sure that we're using like approved tools, don't use unsafe functions like get S in C programming because you can never use that securely. Um, Use static analysis to detect problems in your source code as you're writing it. Use dynamic analysis to try and like fuzz test software that has been compiled. So like after you've developed the software, you can test it kind of like um, in a white, gray or black box kind of basically you test it while the program's running. Um, include, you know, and that can include fuzz testing um, where we're basically like randomizing inputs. Um, do an attack surface review, which obviously is similar to this stage here. Uh, and then once we've released it, we do incident res think about incident response, like how we actually respond to problems, and do a review of how it all went, um, and, uh, and kind of then just sort of deal with problems as they come up. Um, that was the original kind of like um, life cycle that I proposed. Um, and the, and since then, they've kind of like released this set of practices. So what they say is that if you are developing software, you should make sure that your developers are, pro um, are trained, so they actually understand what the security problems are. Uh, so if they're doing, you know, with they're dealing with databases, for example, do they understand what SQL injection is, um, and so on? Um, and then you, you, def you know. A lot of these are from the previous diagram that I just showed, um, but you know we need to make sure that we define what our security requirements are. Um, we need to perform threat modeling. Again, we talked about that in a previous video. Um, so another one that's on here that wasn't on the previous slide is um, define and use crypt cryptography standards. So you know use the appropriate kind of encryption methods that are um, actually secure. Don't try and invent your own if you don't know what you're doing. Um, or even if you do, it's probably a bad idea to try and invent your own algorithms unless you're a cryptographer. Um, the, 
you should, uh, you know, use well-tested, um, you know, crypto algorithms like AES, for example. Um, you need to think about every time that you include someone else's code in your product, the fact that that could be introducing security issues. Um, and so you need to kind of manage that risk. That's not to say that you shouldn't use other people's code because, you know, li using a library can save you a massive amount of time um, and code that you would have to write yourself. And also you might actually be um, more likely to introduce security bugs than if you use someone else's code that's been coded well um, and that's, you know, been, um, you know, it's used by lots of people and it has lots of eyes on it. Um, so, you know, but you do need to think about that and manage the risk. Um, uh, again, that was on the previous slide. So static analysis, security testing um, includes things like when you um, have some source code and you, um, well, you know, when you use an IDE and it'll underline certain things in your code that, you know, you've not used this variable, you know, those sorts of things. You have, there's lots of tools that exist that can do analysis of software to detect certain security problems. So like um, something that is likely to be a buffer overflow um, or, you know, if you're basically all the different ways that you can, different things that you could do to result in insecure code, um, there are tools that will help you to detect those problems. So you should be running those tools as part of the development of your software. So, um, you know, if it was a, um, an agile kind of uh, method that you were using where you're kind of, you know, developing software in sprints or, you know, um, on an ongoing process, then you might have like a certain point where you say, well, every time before you commit to the master branch um, of the source code repository, you have to do run some static code analysis and check that there's no like critical security problems that are flagged. Um, you know, so you basically just build it into your development um, that way. Um, you perform dynamic analysis. Again, um, that can include things like doing fuzz testing. Um, and, you know, you can write fuzz testing scripts and rules and protocol testers and things like that. That um, you know, Again, we've talked about that in this in previous topics, uh, but we can like fuzz test our software. Um, and you can do that with access to the source code um, because, you know, you can actually um, do, uh, you know, write a really good quality fuzz testing script if you know what your code's actually supposed to do, which is much easier than writing it afterwards. It doesn't stop you. You don't need the source code to do fuzz testing, but it only makes it easier. Um, also, all the kind of unit testing and the standard, like, good quality testing um, that you would do of software before it's released um, is obviously important. So you test your code. Um, so, you know, you run all your unit tests and um, integration tests and the rest of it, um, basically to, to check the quality of, the, of your code, um, which should be best practice anyway in software development, but it's particularly important uh, to make sure that those tests include testing security issues. Um, perform penetration testing. Um, and the difference here is that we're actually trying to attack a kind of complete system. So you've got the system and then you're actually running as an attacker against that system to see what you're able to, to achieve. Um, and each of those steps <clears throat> you can use, you can be informed by the threat modeling that you've done previously. So your threat modeling will have identified specific threats that are likely to um, exist against your system or things that you need to design mitigations for. So then when you're designing all your tests, you can kind of like think about that, um, your threat modeling, and make sure that you're actually doing the right kinds of tests to test for the things that you, um, you know, you identified as being potential threats. Uh, and then you establish a standard incident response process for how you deal with um, security problems in the source code, but then also, I guess, as an organization. <clears throat> so, Moving on from Microsoft um, SDL, there are there have been other um, proposals. So Gary um, McGraw, um, who is big in this space, he's writ written a number of textbooks in this area. 
um, on how to build security into systems, um, has been a proponent since before, um, you know, all of the Microsoft um, change of, you know, the way that they do things. That, you know, he's been saying for a long time that we should be being proactive and building security into systems. Um, and so he's proposed seven software security touch points. Um, and there's a lot of overlap with what we've just talked about, so I won't go into much detail on ones I've already mentioned, but the ones that he mentions is code review. So obviously that, um, you know, is, is important that you're reviewing the source code to look for security problems. That can include manual, but it's also importantly using analysis tools. Uh, so that includes static analysis, for example. Um, architectural risk analysis, which is just another word for threat modeling. So, um, <clears throat> so stride threat modeling, which we've talked about in the past, is um, one of the outputs from Microsoft of the way that they propose doing threat modeling. And it works really well and it's really easy to understand and um, it's good for analyzing, um, basically pulling out likely security threats. Uh, and this is just a different kind of take on threat modeling. So um, it, it says that you should look at attack resistance. Um, so that looks at like, you know, how well it defend uh, your system fares against, you know, specific attacks, which you could look at things like attack trees and that to, to kind of think about. Um, there's whether um, you do ambiguity, ambiguity analysis. So you can get a number of um, security folks to analyze a system and look for whether or not there's any ambiguity in its design, uh, which could lead to there being security problems, like if um, certain, um, um, if people's like understanding of how the security works isn't consistent, that could point to there being underlying problems. Uh, and look at weakness analysis, so looking at for specific security problems. Um, and there's penetration testing, um, risk-based security testing, which is essentially, you know, doing like good quality testing during development. Um, and again, being informed by all of the above um, when you are designing your test tests. Abuse cases is an interesting one. So for those of you who have done studied um, software development in general, um, you often uh, develop and document use cases, so which is like what you expect the system to be able to do. So when this system is functioning, a person should be able to um, log in to the system using their password. An abuse case is how uh, an attacker wants the system to work. So an abuse case might be to be able to log in without a password, and then you would kind of like um, go from there. So um, that it's, it's a different way of thinking about it. So basically documenting the ways that someone would try and abuse the system, um, which I think is a quite a clever, um, quite a clever way of thinking about it, a bit different as well from what is usually um, done. So, you know, that's something that you could incorporate into your development life cycle is when you're thinking about the positive things you want people to be able to do, also think about what the um, and malicious people are going to be trying to do. Uh, and then there's security requirements, which we've, comes up a lot, obviously, because it's, you know, you need to be able to define what you're actually trying to achieve in terms of security. And then there's the operations, um, so, you know, operationally how the security works in your system. Um, so a, a separate um, set of guidelines comes from Safe Code, which is the Software Assurance Forum for Excellence in Code. Um, <clears throat> that organization publishes a document called Fundamental Practices for Secure Software Development, Essential Elements of a Secure Development Lifecycle Program. <clears throat> and they define these steps that you should everyone should be following. So again, should be doing security requirements. They call it application security control definition. There's the design, um, and they specify some specific best practices. So um, this didn't come up in um, so far, but like making sure that the software like provides some accountability for what's happening, like do logging within the software, and there's threat modeling and a bunch of other things that should be happening at the design phase. Secure coding practices, um, you make sure you're using um, 
secure functions, don't use untrust, you know, unsafe functions and, and the rest of it. Um, so again, third party components and thinking about the risks there. Again, testing and validation. Um, manage your findings. So when you do any of these reviews, um, they say that what you should be doing is um, tracking what you found in like some kind of like ticketing system, for example, and what you've done to kind of mitigate it. So not only make sure you're actually testing for these things, but actually documenting how you're reacting to the responses that you're getting when you're doing that. Um, also, that uh, software vendors should have a vulnerability um, response and disclosure policy. So think about how you're going to deal with when someone tells you there's a security problem, what are you going to do? And how are you going to work with them to fix the problems? Um, and that might change depending on whether you're a website or some system software, partly because if you're um, partly because if you're system software, then everyone can install your software to test it and do whatever they want to find security problems, which is one of the strengths of you know um, taking that approach. Uh, but if you have like a website, then um, you know you might want to think about having a bug bounty and um, making it easy for people to actually um, be given some guidance about how to interact with you about your security problems um, and whether you can benefit from bug bounty pro programs to find the security problems before a black hat does, for example. Um, and then um, plan implementation and deployment. <clears throat> so um, finally for this video, um, security life cycles. So you can look at these three things that we've just mentioned. So this diagram comes from um, the from Cyboc, the Cybersecurity Body of Knowledge, um, which was published um, by the uh, National Cybersecurity Centre. Um, so, but they they kind of show you that that basically demonstrate. There's quite a lot of overlap between these things. Um, although there are some things that kind of stand out in each. Uh, so for example, the touch points have these abuse cases. Um, and really, when you are developing software, you should be thinking about how you can um, influence some of these things into your systems to make it more secure. So if you are a small one-man uh, team uh, of doing some software development, then the complete Microsoft SDL is probably not what you're going to follow. So if you go to Microsoft's website, there's this full archive of all this documentation that you can follow to do like really good quality um, <clears throat> review of your security at every stage in the, in the life cycle. Um, I, I mean, I've seen, well, I had, I've had a, a student as a project, um, attempt to follow the complete SDL on a simple <clears throat> project that he was working on, and the amount of documentation that he produced uh, for this like simple website was like about this much, um, like folder of uh, all the testing and and um, you know threat modeling and the rest of it that he'd done um, on his on the system, and. It's clearly it was not designed for that, for like one person to, you know, complete all of the paperwork, for example. Um, and so the, as it is, Microsoft SDL might be able to be used <clears throat> basically exactly as it is if you're a big enough team and you happen to follow kind of like a waterfallish kind of approach to software development. Um, but even if that's not you, what you can do is learn from um, all these great resources, these great tools, Think about how you can do static analysis, dynamic analysis, threat modeling um, as part of the de design of your system. And, um, you know, I guess it's still an unsolved problem in that if you are a um, software developer, um, you kind of have to take from this and, and use it. But this will say, you know, has the potential to save you from having all these security problems in the future is that it's easy to take a little bit of extra time 
while you're developing the system in the first place and designing the system to think about security, make sure that you're doing it well so that you don't end up um, you know, having uh, massive security breaches because there's software vulnerabilities in your software. So um, yeah, super important stuff. R really interesting, lots of really good resources out there that you can use to improve the security of the software that you're developing.